Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Earth Size Show. This is episode three. And today I am joined by a wonderful guest, Dr. Yi Chao. Now, Dr. Yi Chao graduated with and got his PhD from Princeton. And after that, he worked at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, working with satellites to monitor the ocean's health and its conditions. And after that, he founded his own company, SeaTrek, that we'll be talking about more in this interview. Now, one thing I want to say before we dive right in is that the only reason we have humans or we did have humans on the moon for a bit of time is because we had a map of the moon. The only reason that NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab has put a rover, Perseverance, on Mars is because we had a map. But I wish I could say the same thing about our very own oceans. And I'm glad that I have Dr. Chow to discuss this with me. But what I find really crazy is that an area twice the size of Mars remains unmapped in our seas today. That is just ridiculous. But we'll find out more about how companies such as SeaTrek, Dr. Chow's company, are tackling that and what efforts are in place to further the field of ocean exploration and seafloor mapping. So Dr. Chow, thank you for coming. How are you doing today? Doing well, thank you for the opportunity. Before we start, I have to uh, say congratulations what you have accomplished. It's very inspiring uh, what you have done and inspiring the next generation. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Chow. Uh, very heartwarming intro. <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to ask you, so I'll be, we'll be talking about seafloor mapping today. And for our listeners who don't actually know what that is, could you, would you care to explain some of the dynamics of it and what it actually entails? Yeah, thank you for that background. And everybody knows we know more about the surface of the moon and surface of the Mars than our own seafloor. And then seafloor map, if you think about it, it's a, such a fundamental map to have. And then uh, it's hard to imagine we can plan our daily life without knowing the map of on land, right? So the street map we take for granted, we navigate in our car. And then imagine we don't know how where the mountains are, how tall those mountains are. It's just impossible to think about planning our daily activities. And that's essentially what happening in the situation on the seafloors. And then we only map 20% with our in-situ instrumentation with somewhat higher resolution on the order of 10, so maybe a hundred meters. 80% um, of the seafloor uh, is only estimated by satellite. Satellite flying very fast. They, if you measure every second, satellite goes 6,000 meters per second on the wow. ground. So essentially that's a pixel size of the seafloor map, 80% of the ocean, that's the floor seafloor map we have to work with. So that's really the map we, uh, as a community, we wanna map the, in the next decades. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. And I think I read uh, recently that on places like the moon, we, the resolution of those maps are down to the meters. They're oh, yeah. very, very accurate. And it just makes you think, what have we been doing for so long on Earth with no map of the oceans? But I'm glad that companies like yours and companies and organizations such as Seabed 2030 that we'll discuss more about later are actually accelerating the rate at which we'll get a map, um, hopefully by 2030. But that's great. Okay, so more about your company, SeaTrek. Uh, why don't you tell me and uh, the audience what they stand for and what it actually means? Yeah, SeaTrek developed this technology harvesting energy from ocean temperature difference. So essentially we are solving uh, energy problem for underwater autonomous sensors, autonomous vehicles. Um, traditionally these vehicles and sensors have to power by batteries and they have limited lifetime, but the battery runs out. You have to have a ship nearby to change the battery or you let the robot die in the sea, right? So either way is either ex expensive use ships or not sustainable, leaving batteries behind. So SeaTrek mm -hmm. solved this problem saying, can we harvest energy locally underwater and ocean have this 
unlimited thermal energy associated with temperature difference. Ocean is warm at the surface, cold the depths. So essentially we convert that thermal energy into electricity. So the robots swim in the ocean, they can recharge themselves by the sea so they can continue to have a longer mission life, power bring more sensors and then be more sustainable. So we don't have to worry about to recycle them once the battery runs out. Yeah, that's very interesting, um, especially the fact that your company and companies like yours are making ocean exploration and mapping the seafloor more sustainable. I think that's a key issue that companies like yours are trying to tackle. And many people will be for that because I feel like we've entered an age of climate activism. Uh, Extinction Rebellion was very popular as well. And so being more sustainable is definitely going to be more popular and the better choice for the planet as well. So I think that's really good. And so could you talk more about uh, some of the science and the technology behind how these um, floats and flotation devices work, uh, specifically with the phase change materials? Yeah, the platform we powered initially, we call this profiling floats. This is like the hot air blowing in the ocean. They basically move up and down. They bring sensors. They can measure the property of the water from the surface all the way to the seafloor. And then there are thousands of them in the water already in the last decade or two. There's a huge revolution of underwater robotic to bring this autonomous system into the ocean so we can multiply thousands of sensors rather than tens of ships, right? So we only have a few ships available for research community and to do ocean exploration. Uh, by the time we have thousands of these vehicles and then we keep busy changing batteries because the battery runs out after say, typically after a couple hundred profiles and dives and battery runs out. And then most of these are low cost uh, sensors. And then currently we just uh, dispose them in the ocean, put in new ones uh, into the sea. It's cheaper to put in more new robots into the sea uh, mm -hmm. because the ship time is so expensive. Um, so you can imagine this is very costly operation because the uh, Elon Musk, SpaceX reuse the rocket ships and then we, are not, we sort of reuse our valuable sensors in the ocean as well. Correct. And it's just not sustainable as you go from thousands of robots or you get tens of thousands, or eventually to address the climate change, you need probably millions of robots at sea. So it's hard to imagine this robots that goes disposed in the ocean without being properly recycled. So we kind of address this problem in both ways to provide energy to provide more data. And then at the same time, and then you only have a hands off of a system, eventually you can recover and you can recycle them. Yeah, that's very interesting, actually, because it's just very time consuming having to recollect or just discard and then put more floats back into the sea to map the ocean floor. And um, for our listeners who don't know, the way that companies like Sea Trek and ocean exploration and mapping companies work and the way they map is actually with flotation devices. So just imagine a float, literally any float that you can think of even for swimming, just that packed with sensors. And it's as simple as that. Well, it's not simple, it's very complicated, but that's the premise behind it. Mm -hmm. And it just dives down, takes the measurements, come back up and just repeats over a period of time. So that's what Dr. Chow is referring to there. So yes, that's very interesting, Dr. Chow. Um, so what would you say C-Trek considers um, when thinking about the economic scalability of such operations, because in order to map, because we've only mapped 20% of our seafloor as of yet. So 80% is left. And in order to do that, you'd need millions and millions of floats, loads of sensors all across the planet. And now that we've got a fifth ocean, um, that's going to enhance that even more. So what would you think uh, C-Trek considers when thinking about economic scalability? It is a big problem. Um, so estimated uh, the 80% of the seafloor take about 300 ship years. So in other words, if you have 300 ships, this is a big ships uh, ocean going, 
uh, take the whole year doing nothing but the map the seafloor. Obviously, we don't have that resources estimated about five billion dollars. Wow. It's a price tag is difficult to uh, uh, to accomplish. So we thought um, uh, the the one way to do that rather than use ships and then you use a lot of carbon footprint, uh, a lot of people involved, very costly is to use robotic technology. So people have developed the surface vehicles powered by the sun, solar energy, the wind energy, the wave energy. And that, that's, that's one way to, um, to attach sensors. But a surface uh, autonomous systems uh, mapping seafloor, you'll need a lot of energy to see, to uh, map the seafloor. So we thought it would be easier to uh, map from the, the subsea and then to uh, to use the sensor at a thousand meters, so we can use low power sensors, and then we can scale up many of them. So we estimated we want to do uh, typically about hundreds of million data points to fill this eighty percent of the gap. And we believe if we do a few thousand of these autom autonomous floats, and then take about a decade, and then we can accomplish goal to map uh, all the eighty percent of the gaps. Okay, that's that's quite fascinating, actually. Just the the techniques behind that, where to position the floats and the sensors in order to you know make up for the cost, and also thinking about how time consuming it is. So that is very interesting indeed. And then thinking about life years for these ships, how realistic do you think Seabed 2030's goal is? of mapping it by 2030. And for the audience members who don't know, Seabed 2030 is an organization that aimed to map the seafloor by 2030, hence the name. So yes, Dr. Chow. Yeah, this is a very good goal. And that if, we can, if we want to map the seafloor, this 80% gaps, this is a only decade we can do that. It's a, declared as a UN decade of ocean development and sustainability. It's the right decade for all oceanographers. And as CBET 2030 have um, set up a goal, the community can rally behind it. I'm very optimistic and then we will be able to do that in these decades. And then um, this international community are all ready to, uh, to, to do this uh, ambitious uh, project. And, and then there's a tremendous support from the government from international organizations, including philanthropic organizations as well. Okay. Okay, that's that's good to hear actually, because um, I think they started in, a, I think it was 2017 and they've mapped 17% since then. So it's quite good to hear that actually. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So moving on, you talked about the sensors being placed at different depths to when considering economic scalability. Mm -hmm. Would you consider for your fleet of floats and sensors, would you consider uh, benthic explorers? And those are ones that lay on the seafloor directly. Would you consider those? We, uh, those are a longer term uh, vision to use our energy to power uh, seafloor sensors. Uh, for example, we work with marine geologists try to figure out the way to power uh, ocean bottom seismometer, for example, to monitor earthquakes. Uh, there's also uh, sensors monitor uh, seafloor ecosystem uh, so that we can better map the, 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 the animal community the ecosystem and then the health in the deep ocean so that we know how to protect them uh, when, the, when we try to uh, utilize our ocean. Um, for the most part, uh, our technology is best utilized in the middle of the water column. So be somewhere between the surface and the sea floor. Um, so every time those vehicles come to the surface, they can communicate to the satellites, send the data back. And then, and then by the time your profiles between thousand meters to a surface, also we passing through this warm cold and warm to warm layers and that's the temperature difference we convert to electricity uh, so every time you communicate to the to, to satellites you harvest energy kind of extract energy from the sea and then you go back to a thousand meters to emission so it's a perfect scenario for our energy uh, harvesting technology to 
collect data and then work with uh, the environment and then at the same time communicate data back to your command center. Wow, I think the idea of just the floats coming up and down and just recharging is just amazing because it could just be infinite. It could just be endless, right? So eventually much- energy, we essentially remove, yeah, infinite in a sense from an energy perspective. So energy is the biggest uh, limitation for underwater operations. So we kind of uh, solve, you remove that as a bottleneck. And now we are looking at sensor failures, biofouling, underwater, and it, it's a very challenging environment to work with. And then you could have sensor fouls or sensor become unstable. Uh, so even though we ro- remove energy as a limitation, there's still other factors affect this autonomous system to fail. Uh, okay. It's not the energy, but it's something else. So with energy, we can also um, uh, uh, do anti-fouling uh, mitigation device, and then we can help to make the sensor last longer using UV light to shine every once in a while, for example. And so there's other ways to extend the sensor life. So kind of help uh, collect more data at a lower cost. Okay. That's, that's, that's pretty cool, actually, I've got to admit. But um, yeah, I mean, it being infinite, yes, I agree that it, it would be infinite to a certain extent. But as you said, there are always some limitations present. It's not just going to sure. go on forever. But yeah. And on that topic of technology, where do you see blue technology taking off in the future? And I'm referring, when I say blue technology for the audience members, it's um, technology just to do with ocean science and oceanography. Yeah, there's an increasing awareness for the blue economy and blue tech is taking off. This again, this is the right decades to the awareness is there, uh, increasing uh, focus on climate change oceans role in climate, um, oceans health, uh, healthy food from the sea, medicine from the sea, biofuel, clean fuel from the sea, uh, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, uh, combat climate change. And so you can see a tremendous amount of uh, uh, industries is ready, is primed to take off in this decade, in the, in the coming years. Um, so, so I think the government also invest significantly in blue tech space and Department Energy, uh, National Ocean Atmospheric Oceanic Administration, um, Department of Defense, and NASA. All these federal government start to invest in the ocean-related technology. Um, the community is, is fully aware of the blue economy. People like you bring the awareness to the next generation. I think we are all primed and ready to uh, take the blue economy and blue tech to the next level. That's that's really great to hear, actually. I love that. Um, because I think ocean science, ocean exploration, all of this usually comes under the shadow of space, if I'm not mistaken, because of the, the media representations, the movies, uh, and just the expanse of space that everyone just loves. Uh, people who are just aren't even into space or going into space research just love it. And not as much as ocean science. I mean, maybe that has a, there's a religious perspective to that, you know, heaven and hell, but uh, we'll never know. But hopefully blue technology, ocean science, oceanography, it all increases exponentially in the future. And, you know, companies like yours bring that sort of innovation to the table that we need to progress as a species into the future and hopefully onto different planets as well, like Mars. See there, I'm talking about space again. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, space uh, exploration is an interesting analogy. Um, I think people fascinated about space because you have a a very interesting, uh, simple goal. You want to land people on the moon, for example. You want to bring people to Mars. It's a simplest goal. Uh, the community can rally behind it. For ocean, it's a more and more complex. We want to understand the ocean to uh, make sure ocean is healthy, uh, make sure we can still use the ocean uh, for the future generations and a benefit the societies, right? So ranging from healthy proteins all the way to clean biofuels and 
combat climate change. So it's a little bit more complex and then, you know, uh, compared to the space uh, exploration. But I think it's the next frontier, it's the last frontier on earth. So the ocean tech, ocean blue tech, blue economy will be the next uh, rush to uh, for the technology companies like us. Yeah, exactly. As, as I think we both said before, it's the final frontier of exploration that's left. I was talking to someone the other day and that's exactly what they said, the final frontier. So all in good spirit with their final frontier kind of. Hopefully that becomes some sort of pop culture in the future. That would be great for the younger generation. Yeah, just the mysterious, right? So for 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 those people who have a curiosity and every time you go to sea, you almost discover something new. So there's so much, so much unknown, a lot of mystery. And that if there's secret on earth, that's the deep sea, right? Precisely. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And on that topic of, you know, people's perceptions and media and things like that, what do you think just the general public and uh, younger audiences and younger people such as myself should be more aware of when it comes to ocean science? And what do you think companies like Sea Trek could do to make it more popular? Well, we certainly want to engage with um, more broadly. O oceanography used to be a very niche discipline. It's a specialized field, has, is relatively small. Uh, I think the blue economy where elevate ocean science into the mainstream uh, to inspire the next generation. So when, um, you know, say, uh, I congratulate what you have done, accomplished to inspire your generation. I think company like us should try very hard to uh, tell the ocean story. Um, there's a lot of success stories in the past we probably didn't tell properly. Um, those uh, people, pioneers in oceanography are heroes and that we should celebrate their success and then make their story uh, uh, aware, you know, not only our generation, but the next gen younger generation. Um, so we, we sort of treat them as movie stars and then, uh, and so we can inspire more people get involved and then either getting into the ocean fields and the blue economy or just engaging in a, um, uh, get involved in a small way. Um, it's like a plastic problem. Everybody uh, take the village to, uh, to address this big problem the same way for ocean and climate and everybody can do their part and uh, be contribute uh, their own efforts. Yes, precisely. Um... And I think the last bit that you mentioned there, I think that resonates quite well with me about everybody contributing, because if I think there is some sort of initiative on for companies like and organizations like Seabed 2030, where you can actually contribute data mm -hmm. that has been collected. And so if you have that bathymetric data that is crowdsourced, and if yeah. everybody does it, then suddenly you go from one to 10 to a, a thousand, to a million, to a billion people contributing. And I think that sort of, as I said before, exponential increase exactly. and change in people's mindsets about the ocean, I think that will do everyone some good and in the long yeah. term as well. Exactly. So for example, the simplest problem we can come up with, 80% of the seafloor need to be mapped in the next decades. And we don't really have infinite resources to map them at the same time. You know, where you want to map first. So that could be a very intriguing problem for the public, for, for, for students, for people from all ages to get involved, is to use the modern methods, you know, cloud computing, AI, machine learning, is try to help us to prioritize you know, how to map, uh, how to rank the 80% of the ocean, and how do you map, what to, where to map next year, and then the year after, and then take, a huge amount of people to get involved and uh, to work together to develop that list and then navigate the thousands of robots or tens of thousands of robots, robotic yeah. systems. And um, each one of them can be steered, need to be controlled. So computer is smart to the extent people have to get involved. This human have to assist the robotic exploration. So we take a huge amount of people to get involved is to map this 80% of the seafloor in the next decades. Exactly. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so just, 
I just wanted to touch on something quickly. So you know the X Prize, which was founded by Peter Diamandis. Have you? Do you think that there is potential for companies like C Trek to be involved with the X Prize? You know, to incentivize problem solving. Yeah, our energy solution can be applied not only for robotic exploration to map the seafloor. We also try to get involved, uh, power the the robotic to measure uh, temperature and uh, monitor ocean warming as part of the climate change. We also try to power additional sensors, monitor the chemistry, the biology of the ocean. Uh, potentially, we also help uh, industries like uh, shipping and offshore aquaculture. Uh, one of the problems we are looking at potentially is uh, seaweed farming, how to um, provide our en renewable energy to monitor um, the farm operation, to develop the data system for farm operators to scale up, to take more CO2 from the atmosphere. And that's a hundred million dollar price, X yes. price is currently competing. Um, one of the challenges is to do this autonomous monitoring. So you need energy, you need a sensor, you need the data, you need a decision-making. And that's where c -Track potentially can contribute and then uh, we we not not only help to uh, uh, bring the water from the deep sea to feed the farm, but also we can convert that energy, uh, convert that temperature difference into an electricity to power autonomous sensors to help this decision making. Yeah, that's good to hear actually because um, the way that I, I've just been really fascinated with the X Prize recently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know how I, or where I found them, but. I think just the idea of including money into that and incentivizing that kind of initiative to solve problems in the earth sciences specifically, I think it's just a great idea because the way our society works is just, it revolves around money and mm -hmm. such incentives. And if you provide that, then people are more likely and more obliged to do something. So I think they've tapped into a really good market there um, yeah. for this kind of innovation. And I say the word exponential so much and abundance, but that is exactly the way that things are going right now with companies like yours, like the X Prize, like SpaceX. And so I think these kind of companies will be at the forefront of leading our species into the future. Yeah, it's provide opportunity for us to think out of the box, right? So also reach out to other companies, academic institutions, you know, for example, in our case, uh, give us opportunity to put a team together, to look for different technology, to integrate them, and then take a team to compete one of these big prize, for example, solve this very complex problem. So traditionally, our company focused on a product and a specific market, but the X Prize really provide us opportunity to partner with a number of different expertise and then to solve much bigger problems. Yeah, indeed, yes. I just have one final thing I'd like to ask. How do you think that uh, seafloor mapping and ocean exploration, how far do you think it can be commercialized in the future? Is there much benefit of that? Yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning, seafloor is a, such a fundamental variable. So it's almost like it was, once you have the map, you can build on top of the map, you can monitor the ocean health, you can mount a modern ocean state, how they change from day to day, from year to year, from decade to the decades. And that is really the information to guide the blue economy, to know the map, to know the condition. We take for granted, have smartphone access, access all the information on a fingertip, right? Yeah. So if you want a blue economy to take off 10, 20 years from now, you open your smartphone, I, iPhone 20, for example, at that point, yeah. and that's all the information should be on your fingertip, you know, from the seafloor all the way to the temperature in the ocean, the chemistry, the biology, the D, DNA uh, history, and, and then forecast them, you know, it's almost like a, a planning your activities in the future and then what the ocean look like tomorrow, next week. And then that's really the information where guide uh, your day-to-day -day operation, and then make decision to operate um, offshore wind farms and offshore farming, 
uh, could be a mining operation in the future, make sure we are protecting our ecosystem. So all of these offshore operations rely on the result from ocean exploration and the seafloor mapping. Yeah, that sounds really good because I find that when I talk to people sometimes about space, uh, sorry, ocean sea, ocean exploration and uh, seafloor mapping, sometimes they get bored and they think, okay, it's not that interesting. How will it apply to me? But then if you really think about it, just the science behind it and thinking about the future, how it will actually play into these different mechanisms, both biological uh, and marine, and just economically as well, you actually get to build a picture and paint one of how it will affect your lives in the future. So I think yeah. that is indeed very interesting. And I think something that audiences around the world do need to hear so that they can contribute, as we said before. I agree. And now because we don't live there, right? So we have to find a benefit, economic benefit, kind of indirect link to people, our daily life from protein all the way to biofuel we are using, the food we are eating, the medicine, the new medicine we enable, uh, new discovery, you know, beyond the curiosity, right? So, so have to connect with the econ economy of a daily life with people. Yeah, exactly. Well, Dr. Chow, this has been great. Uh, thank you for coming today. And for our audiences, if you want to check out uh, Dr. Charles' company, again, it's a reminder, it's C-Trek. So you go to ctrek.com, I believe is the website. Um, he's also a council member at Forbes. So he writes articles there as well. So do check that out as well. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoyed the episode, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in and uh, look out for the next one coming soon. So Dr. Thank Charles- you for Thank you for the opportunity. Oh yeah. Thank you once again for coming and uh, yeah, have a nice day, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.